Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, an nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. He says, some of the meanings may suggest that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is more dear or closer or takes precedence for the believers even over their own selves. That we love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than anything else that's in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a rigorously authenticated hadith in Bukhari, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ After taking an oath, al qasam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the one who holds my soul in his hand. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام None of you truly believe until I am more beloved to him than his father or his parents, his children in all of humanity. صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم Imam Ali كرم الله وجهه He said كان صلى الله عليه وسلم أحب إلينا من كل شيء ومن الماء البارد he said the Prophet ﷺ was more beloved to us than anything, even more so than cold water. And this metaphor is, cold water obviously is a metaphor for life because for the desert Arab, water meant life. This is a way of saying that he ﷺ was more dear to us than life itself. ﷺ. When you hear these statements of the Sahaba, they're just very ajib, the kind of love that they had for him and how they demonstrated their love. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, I prefer, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I prefer that Abu Quhaifa become Muslim over Abu Talib. Who is Abu Talib is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was raised by him. Inna ka la tahdi man ahbabt. You cannot guide all those whom you love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him. Right? But Sayyidina Abu Bakr, who is Abu Quhaifa, his own father, he says to the Prophet Sallallahu that I would prefer Abu Talib, your uncle, to, to become Muslim over my own father. Why? Because the happiness of the Prophet Sallallahu is the happiness of Abu Bakr. If he's happy, he's happy. When the Prophet Sallallahu would laugh, they would start laughing. When the Prophet Sallallahu would weep, they would start weeping. Because they were so close to him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. An nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. When the Quraysh captured one of the, uh, the Sahaba named Khubayb ibn Adi, and they took him out to kill him, and they basically put him on a stake, they crucified him. And they were making fun of him, and they said to him, they were you know, deriding him and making fun of him, and they were saying to him, uh, don't you wish Muhammad was here? being killed and you were at home resting with your family and he said I don't wish that a thorn prick the finger of the messenger and Abu Sufyan ibn Harb who was there obviously was non-Muslim at the time he made an amazing statement is I've never seen anyone love anyone like the companions of the Prophet love the Prophet and Ghazwat Uhud, another example, a female companion named Nusayba bintu Ka'b, radiallahu ta'ala anha. She stood in front of the horse of a mushrik who had a sword in his hand, who was going to attack the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa His name was Ibn Qami'ah. Qami and he was, she was standing in front of his horse. This is a woman who came to the battlefield to give water to the Mujahideen. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we know the story, became under siege. So she picked up the sword and began to defend him. And she was struck to the ground by Ibn Qami'ah, and she had fractured her shoulder, her clavicle. And her son Zay came running towards her, saying, Ummi, Ummi, my mother, my mother. And he said to her, she said to him, she said, get away from me and protect the Prophet ﷺ. That was a priority for her, was the safeness and the well-being of the Prophet ﷺ. These are just some of the manifestations of the, of the muhabba that the Sahaba عنهم, had for the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهُ If you say, if you love Allah, and قُلْ is interesting, because قُلْ is known as an imperative, a present active imperative, according to English grammar. فِعِلْ amr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet directly, قُلْ And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the Prophet sallallahu directly, this shows the ta'zim and the tashrif of the Prophet sallallahu It shows his exalted station. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And this happens over and over again in the Quran. And it really demonstrates a loving relationship 
between the two. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, Wallahu rasuluhu ahaqu an yurduhu, that Allah and His Messenger, it is more befitting that you please Him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the end of the, this clause, He uses a third person singular uh, pronoun, even though Allah and His Messenger are two. And the reason is because, according to Imam al Qurtubi, may Allah be pleased with him, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is demonstrating that obedience to the Messenger of Allah is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and vice versa. It shows a very, very close personal relationship. As our mother Aisha said to the Prophet, وسلم, she said, Your Lord hastens to fulfill your wishes. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, soon will thy Lord give you that which will please thee. On one occasion, the Prophet وسلم, he casted a glance towards the heavens. He just looked towards the heavens. But he had something in his heart, and obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows the hearts. He knows what's in the sudur, in the qulub of the human being. That's all he did, sallallahu alayhi wa He looked towards the heavens and he had this shawq, this, this tashweeq in his heart. He had a desire or longing in his heart. And his desire was for the qibla to be changed back to Mecca. That's what he wanted to happen. He didn't vo vocalize it. He just looked towards the heavens and he had this desire in his heart. Right? It's very, very interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, قَدْ نَرَى تُقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ he says, indeed, قَدْ harfa tahqiq. Indeed, we have seen you turn your face towards the heavens. Right? The Prophet ﷺ, he wanted the Qibla to be changed back to the original Qibla. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ بَيْتٍ بُدِيَ عَلِ النَّاسِ لَلَّذِي بِبَكَّةَ مُبَارَكَةً That the first house of worship ever dedicated to the worship of the one true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was in Bekka, which is Mecca. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, we see you in Nara. And he uses a plural. This is Nunu Ta'zim. Indeed, we have seen you turn your face towards the heavens. Indeed, we, and this is an amazing verb here. We need to study grammar. There's so much emphasis in this verb. Right? We have Lam of Toki, Nun of Toki, Nunu Ta'zim. We have Kaful Khitab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in other words, He's emphasizing it twice and talking about himself, referring to himself in the plural form, in the royal plural, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is honoring the person that he's addressing, the Prophet sallallahu Verily, verily, we will turn you to a qibla that will please you. Taradah. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu he cast a glance, fissama, he looked towards the heavens, and he had this shawq in his heart, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had this desire, this longing for the qibla to be changed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he changes it. So this demonstrates the loving, personal, intimate relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he says, فَوَلِّ وَجْهَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ So turn your face towards the direction of the sacred masjid. وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّ وُجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَةً And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He changes the person from second person singular to the jama'ah, to the plural. It's called iltifat, right? Sudden change. This is a rhetorical device if you study rhetoric. And people who don't really understand Arabic, like these, you know, the, the classical, quote-unquote, classical European orientalists, who basically have the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in Arabic. They haven't studied these things in depth. They'll say, this is an inconsistency in the Qur'an. There's a change of tense suddenly. They don't understand the nuance. What's the purpose behind the change of tense? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, wajhaka, and then here, wujuhakum. Your face, singular to your faces. What is the significance of that? The significance is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is not only speaking to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but He's talking to the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? He's referring to the Ummah. He's speaking directly to the Ummah. He's speaking to us. So this demonstrates also, not only is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very close to his Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but also we are very close to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when Allah addresses him, he addresses us at the same time. We have to understand that. It's very beautiful. It's a beautiful nuance in the Qur'an. Because there are some people who say that the job of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is simply to deliver the news. 
And that's it. He's a delivery man. He brings the letters or the mail, and then he goes, and you have no contact with him. You don't see him anymore. You don't desire to see him. He just brings the news. Imam al Sufi he mentions an interesting story, story of Sayyidina Bilal, radiallahu ta'ala anha. When Sayyidina Bilal, when the Prophet ﷺ had passed away, Sayyidina Bilal couldn't even stay in the city of Medina. He couldn't even stay there. <clears throat> because everything reminded him of the Prophet ﷺ. This type of love, right? So he had to leave the city of Medina because everything was by association connected to the Prophet ﷺ. So he went to Damascus and he stayed in Damascus uh, for over a year. And then he had a dream of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ya Bilal, mahad al jafa Oh Bilal, what is this aversion? What is this uh, distance that you have? Isn't it about time that you come visited me? So Sayyidina Bilal, he comes into the city of Medina, and as soon as he comes into the city, he starts weeping, because everything reminds him of the Prophet ﷺ. Everything reminds him of the Prophet ﷺ. So then he comes into the city, and he goes into the masjid, and he visits the Prophet ﷺ in his masjid. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq sees him, and he says, why don't you give us an adhan, like you used to do? And he said, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I physically can't do it. I'm not able to do it. And then Sayyidina Umar sees him and says, give us an adhan. He says, I can't do it. And then Hassan and Hussein, who looked like the Prophet sallallahu the ulama say that Imam Hassan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, from the head up, he resembled the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because the Prophet is his grandfather. And from the neck down, Imam Hussein, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, resembled the Prophet And he hadn't seen these children in over a year. And children grow very quickly. In a few months, they change. So now they look. There are two beautiful young men that look like the Prophet And they say, please give us an adhan. And Sayyidina Bilal, he decides to make the adhan. And he begins doing the adhan. And when he begins doing it, the people in Medina, they say, this is the Sot of Bilal. Bilal is here. So they come into the streets of Medina. And Imam Subki, Subki says that even women that had not left their homes in years and years, old women that stay in the house, they started to come out of their house. Because people started saying, Bu'itha Rasulullah, the Prophet ﷺ has been resurrected. That's why Bilal is giving the adhan. So they come into the masjid, they listen to the adhan, but Sayyidina Bilal could not even finish the adhan. He couldn't even get to the end of the adhan. Because as soon as he, as soon as he said, Ashadu anna Muhammadan, his legs gave out and he fell on the ground. Because he couldn't even say the name of his beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he told them, I told you, I can't do this. This is how in love they were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet says in the hadith, وَدِدْتُ لَوْ أَنِّي رَأَيْتُ إِخْوَانِي You can translate that, would is love. I, I would have loved to have seen my brethren. And the Sahaba said, aren't we your brethren? He said, no, you're, you're my companions. Right? You're the Sahaba. So who are the brethren? Those who come after me who haven't seen me, but they're willing to sacrifice their wealth and their families just to look at me one time. He's talking about the Ummah. The Prophet has a very close personal relationship with the Ummah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, Qul, which demonstrates again the close relationship with Allah and His Habib. In kuntum. In is called harf al-sharq. This is a uh, conditional particle. Right? It's called an if clause. In English grammar, you have a protasis and you have an apotasis. If and then clause. If you do this, then I'll do that. If you love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِي Then you have to follow me. فِعْلْ amr again. Right? This is the jawab of the shark. If you love Allah, follow me. Follow the Prophet In other words, uh, your Obedience, your ittiba to the Prophet ﷺ is commensurate, is equal with the love that Allah has for you. You want to know if Allah loves you? How closely do you follow the Prophet ﷺ? This is how we can tell. How closely are we uh, aligned with his character, his manifestations in the inward and the outward, ﷺ? And then he says, Yuhbibkumullah. Right? Yuhbib. And this is, this is majzum. This is called al jazm bit talab. This is something that is, is jussive in English grammar. You call this the mood of this verb, jussive. And the effect of this on the sentence is that it's a purpose clause. The way you would translate this, you say, in order or so that. So it begins by saying, say, if you love Allah, follow me, so that Allah might love you. So that Allah, in order that Allah might love you, 
And in order that, he forgives you your sins. Allah is ghafoorur rahim. Right? So the gift, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is something that we have to earn. We earn it. It's not cheap. There are people who walk around saying, I'm beloved by God. Right? But what do they, what do they have to show for it? How do you know Allah loves you? I know he, he better love me. They want to dictate things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives to everyone. And that's the prerogative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu yakhtasu bi rahmatihi may yasha. To kafir and mu'min alike, he gives his mercy. And mercy is akin to love. But mahabba is a higher station. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give his mahabba to a, not to everybody. It has to be earned, right? Specialized. You have to earn it. The mahabba, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it depends on our ittiba' of the sunnah and of the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So Imam al-Razi and Imam al-Suyuti in their respective tafasir, they say that this verse was actually revealed because the mushrikeen, some of the mushrikeen came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, inna nuhibbu la, we love Allah. Right? And they said about the idols, ma na'budu, ma na'buduhum illa liyuqarribuna ila Allahi zulfa. That we only worship these idols so that they might bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That's, that's, uh, in, in Allah quotes him in Surah Az Zumar. But Ibn Abbas, he says something interesting here. He says this verse was revealed because of Bani Israel in Medina. That a group of Bani Israel, a group of the Jews in Medina, they came to the Prophet وسلم, and they say, We love Allah. Nahnu Allah. We are the sons of God. Right? And we are the beloved of God. And then this verse was revealed. And this is interesting because we're, they're quoting from the Psalms, Psalm 82, 6. It says, all of you are sons of God. And we have to remember something here. In the previous dispensations, a lot of these words that the Quran condemns, a lot of these sort of beliefs that the Quran condemns, back then have different meanings. The, the idea of being a son of God in the Old Testament did not mean that you were the literal son of God. It meant that you were a slave of God, ibad al-mukramun, you are a servant raised to honor. It was totally figurative. However, this idea was corrupted by the Christians because the Christians said that Isa salam, is not the figurative son of God, he is the literal son of God. And this is what they say in their creeds. And obviously this is complete kufur. They say in their creeds, for example, in the Nicene Creed, the, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, in the Greek it says, genethenta uh, upo eisenta, which means that he's maulud He's begotten of God, he's not created by God. That is kufr, there's no doubt about it, right? But in the Old Testament, the Jews, they don't believe that God has children literally. If someone's called a son of God or a daughter of God, they say that's a figurative meaning, although this is not used in the Quran because this concept was corrupted by the time of the revelation of the Quran. But anyway, this verse in the Psalms, this is predicated upon the Bani Israel's obedience to a prophet. That you can't be beloved of God unless you believe in the prophet who is there. In other words, Bani Israel at the time of Isa alayhi salam, they can't reject Isa alayhi salam and say, Nahnu abna'ullah wa hibba'u. We are the sons of God, we are the beloved of God. And they reject the messenger of God. Likewise, when the prophet sallallahu alayhi comes to them and he's preaching to them, he's making da'wah to them, and he's, he's showing them clear signs of his nabuwa, and they said, no, we're the sons of God. That's like a king sending an ambassador to a country, and the people of that country, they insult the ambassador. That's tantamount to insulting the king. That's what that means. Or they kill the ambassador. That's a declaration of war against the king. Right? So when God sends messengers, it is wajib upon us to believe in those messengers. Abdullah ibn Ubay, when this verse was revealed, and Abdullah ibn Ubay is Ra'as al-Munafiqeen, he is the head of the hypocrites in Medina, he said, Muhammad is commanding us to love him as the Christians love Isa alayhi salam. He wants to become a Muslim Jesus, right? This is what he is saying. Abdullah ibn Ubay. It's very interesting because a lot of these Western scholars, they make the same claim, right? That he, the Prophet alayhi salam, he wants to sort of rival Musa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam and things like that. You know, he's saying Muhammad commanded us. But the Prophet وسلم, we know from the Quran, he does not speak from his own hawa, right? And this is what the Quran says. So somebody might say, well, that's circular reasoning. Well, study the life of the Prophet وسلم. Study his life. Even study it from the perspective of non-Muslims who are objective. There are many objective non-Muslims who have written vast corpuses of Syria literature. 
And they say there's never an instance whatsoever in his life where he showed insincerity, where he wanted something else, some ulterior motive. He could have had those types of things in Mecca when they offered him to make him the king, gold and silver and marriages, all of these types of things. He rejected all of that. And he said, he goes to Medina, it's not much better. Yeah, he's the head of state. He can defend the city now, but they're constantly trying to attack him. He literally has to dig a ditch around the city. They have to dig a ditch around the city to keep people from invading Medina, right? And all they wanted from him is, you know, let us worship our gods one day of the year. You can worship, we worship Allah the other days. This is not Tawheed. This is not Tawheed, right? So he's a principled person, even the sincere non-Muslims. And there's many, many of them. They admit to this. He's, he's principled, right? So Allah says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He never speaks from his hawa. So this is interesting as well, as you know that Ibn Ubay said this, that he's commanding, he, he wants to command us to love him like the Christians love Isa alayhi salam. We have to ask ourselves then, what did the Christians do with Isa alayhi salam? Because you know, there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, it's mentioned in the Shema al-Tirmidhi, where he said, لا تتروني كما أطرت النصارى عيسى بن مريم فإنما أنا عبده فقولوا عبد الله ورسوله أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام. He says, don't, you know, flatter me like the Christians did with Isa alayhi salam. I am a servant, so say the messenger of God and his servant, right? And some Muslims actually use this hadith to discourage Muslims from doing uh, permissible activities, like as salah ala nabi We send blessings of peace upon the Prophet ﷺ. This is not what's condemned by the Prophet ﷺ whatsoever. Even if this is all you're doing, if all of your adhkar is salah ala nabi Every time you make dhikr, you're sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet ﷺ. That's a good action. How do we know it's a good action? Because there's sound hadith, Ubay ibn Ka'b. Right? When he said to the Prophet ﷺ, how much of my daily uh, adhkar should I spend on blessings, benedictions upon you? A quarter of it, the Prophet said, that's good but more. Half of it, that's good but more is better. Uh, three quarters of it, that's good but more is better. All of it, he said, that's good. This is from the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sends blessings of peace upon the Prophet. And this is mentioned in the Quran. In the Quran, in its ma'an, in its meanings, is pre eternal. It's pre eternal. This is the articulation of pre eternal meanings. So when we talk about the uncreated aspect without getting too technical, we have to study theology. What I'm trying to say is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before He even created the Prophet, was sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet. Because what's in the Quran is an articulation of pre-eternal, pre-eternal meanings. Min azaliya. And then this fi'l is fi'l mudari'. Right? This is an imperfect tense. Right? Yusalli, yusalluna. Imper what does imperfect mean? That the action has not been completed and will never be completed. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before He created the Prophet وسلم, is sending blessings of peace upon him. And da'iman abadan into the future. We'll always be sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet وسلم. So if Allah is doing this, just ignoring the angels for now, if Allah is doing this, how can we possibly overpraise the Prophet وسلم? Even if we go into a room for 24 hours, and nobody should do this obviously, go for 24 hours a day and not eat and not drink and not sleep, and you're just doing a salah ala nabi you cannot even scratch the surface of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what is condemned is what the Christians said about Isa alayhi salam that have no warrant, right? What did they say? That he's Ibnullah, he's the son of God, he is Allah. This is the orthodox position of Christians, orthodoxy, right? Like the equivalent of what's, what, what we call, for example, Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. Their, uh, their, their dominant opinion, Christian orthodoxy, is that Isa salam, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what's condemned, or he died for your sins. No, this is what's condemned. What does the Quran condemn, right? Giving him divine attributes, these types of things. No one is doing this with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If they're doing it, they're gravely mistaken, right? But we love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the youth especially should not be discouraged by their parents uh, to uh, manifest uh, these, these devotional practices when it comes to the Prophet right? Teach your children to love him This is the key to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very, very important. 
So the Prophet ﷺ, we recognize who he is, that he's a means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us life in both worlds, right? Gave us a good life to live here in the dunya because the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, they make human life sacrosanct. There's many examples of this. Of course, we've all heard the, the hadith, very famous hadith. It's related through multiple chains of transmission of the Bedouin who came into the masjid and he urinated. Right? It's a great lesson of akhlaq, adab, right? of tarbiyah we take from the Prophet ﷺ. He came to the masjid, we know the story. He relieved himself. فَقَامَ النَّاسُ إِلَيْهِ The people got up to address him. They were going to attack him. Right? He said, da'uhu, leave him. And some of the, 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 the narrations, they end at that point. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ, he came to him and said, you know, brother, this is a, a masjid, we keep it clean, and that's where it ends. But there's an interesting conclusion to the story in uh, Tirmidhi in Ahmad. When they left the masjid, because the Bedouin went, he washed himself and he came and he prayed with the Muslim, became Muslim. So at the end of the prayer, when they're walking outside, the Bedouin turns around and addresses all of the Sahaba, the Prophet ﷺ, and he says, Allahumma irhamni wa Muhammadan, wa la tarham ma'na ahadan. Then he said, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and on Muhammad and nobody else. Because he's referring to the Sahaba that scared him, you know, because he's relieving himself and a group of men stand up and start moving towards him. He was scared. So the Prophet ﷺ, he laughed at that. He thought that was funny, right, that he said that. And he said, Laqad hajarta wasi'an. You have, you have constricted something that's vast. What is vast? The rahmah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It's just one example of the Prophet Wasallam, And of course, he's the means by which we have eternal life. He's a means. He's a sabab. All worship, everything is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no doubt about that. Right? The Prophet is a means by which we have eternal life because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him the shafa'ah on the day of judgment. He is shafi' wal mushafa'ah. He is the one who intercedes and he is the one whose intercession is accepted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to understand. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirah li wa lakum fa astaghfiru innahu khuwa la qafuru rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Wa ala saadatina wa ibmatina abi bakar umar uthman wa ali. Wa radhi Allah ta'ala an ashabi rasulillah ijma'in. Yaqulu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi kitabi al-aziz ba'da naqulu a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Inna allaha wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu saldu alayhi wa sallimu tasalima. Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ala ala muhammadin kama sallayta ala ibrahim wa ala ala ibrahim fil alameen. Inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala muhammadin wa ala ala muhammad kama barakta ala ibrahim. وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حمد مجيد اللهم إنا نسألك بنور وجهك الكريم وبحقك عليك حسن الخاتمة عند الممات لنا ولأحبابنا ولجميع المسلمين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا شر ما قضيت ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين يا مقلب القلوب الأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا مقلب القلوب الأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون وأقيموا الصلاة